What is up, friends and family? I want to welcome you back for chapter two of the James Bible study. And um, I'm going to just start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together online, and we just thank you for um, the ability to dig into your word. We ask you for revelation, for ears to hear, eyes that see, and hearts to receive and understand your word, and we thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a couple of quick things up front. I um, wanted to make sure I mentioned that we do have, um, not only am I doing this Bible study, but there is a YouTube channel that you can access uh, more content, more teaching, things like that, but also um, I really like to promote the playlists, which are lots of different ministries, lots of different ministers, topic specific, and um, lots of testimonies and things like that, because, um, you know, we have, we all have things to go through, and we need faith to go through it, and um, hearing encouraging testimony and preaching and teaching helps to build faith, and uh, we talked a lot about that in the last uh, broadcast, but um, those are on there. The link, of course, for that channel, that YouTube channel called the Faith, Hope, Love Initiative is in the description, so you can get it there, but um, uh, should you need it, uh, you can just, uh, well, it's, it's, it's on there, right? tinyurl.com forward slash FHL today. So there's that, and um, like I said, we're going to dive into the book of James, and one of the, uh, and people are obviously, we're all different levels of um, understanding and comprehension and, uh, of, the, of the Word and where we're at with our walk with the Lord and all that type of things, and we always will be. That's just the nature of the uh, nature of the church and the nature of the body of Christ. But one of the things I would encourage you is, uh, and I encourage you, I think, in the last broadcast too, but to slow down when you're reading the Word. It's not a race. You know, it's not like you're just trying to get through a chapter is going to change your life. It's more what you take out of it. And, um, and what you see in the Word that you can um, receive and apply to your life. And so we're not going to be in any hurry. The point of this Bible study is to do exactly that, to really study things, to break it down, to um, look for revelation from the Lord and illumination of these different scriptures. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's dive in from there. So we're in James 2, um, James 2 verse 1 is where I'm starting off at. This is the NASB 1995 version. There's apparently uh, a number of NASB versions. They keep updating it, redoing it, etc., which is fine. But um, it starts off by saying, my brother, or it says my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And that's a huge statement right there by itself, um, because there are so many now, it's going to go on to talk about rich people versus, you know, how they treat, how the, how the early church, James is writing to the early church, and he's talking specifically how they, um, as people are coming into their church building, how do they, how they treat these people? Do they treat one group of people better because they apparently are more affluent, they have more, you know, finances and influence, or, and then one group worse because of their financial, financial situation and what he's getting at is there should be absolutely none of that. Um, a person is a person. Now, not to say that we shouldn't pay honor where honors due. The word does say that, you know, to honor people in, um, in certain positions and respectable positions. But that's not what was going on here. It was just people were, um, they were just people walking in. Some looked poor and some looked rich. But here's the thing. Favoritism applies across the board to absolutely anything. You know, these days there's a lot of back and forth about race and ethnicity and in all this different stuff, but that should be in the world. That should not be in the church. You're not going to fix the world. The world's always going to have their issues and um, fight and, you know, bicker about their opinions and things like that. And, you know, that's, like I said, that's not going to change. But that shouldn't be us in the church. In the church, um, we should be all just brothers and sisters in Christ, you know. And, and so it doesn't matter what the economic or, as I say, social economical background of a person is or anything like that, if we prefer um, any, any person for any reason, you know, um, then we're, we're missing the, uh, the example of Christ, in, so to speak, and what, what, the, what the Word's teaching. So 
Um, he says that, so let's go on reading. And I know I'm not going to be looking at the screen the entire time. I'm on, using my Bible app on my phone here, so forgive me. if I'm not making perfect eye contact with you. But uh, verse 2 says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place, and you say, you sit here, I'm sorry, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Like, wow, you know. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? That is a lot right there. Um, now, again, it's, it's easy when we see this to, uh, based on, you know, our background to, to judge these people who he's writing to and go, I cannot believe you would say to someone, you sit over there, you know, and sit down on my, you know, sit by my feet or stand over there by the door or whatever. But the truth is we're all guilty of this. We've all played favoritism. We've all preferred um, people maybe that are more like us in one way, shape, or form um, and all that type of stuff. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, when we see this, we should look at it and we should look at ourselves and go, am I playing favoritism um, in any area of my life? And if I am, then I need to repent of that. You know, bring it, first of all, you have to admit it to yourself. And that's, that's one step. Then you have to confess it to the Lord because you're not going to confess something to him that you haven't admitted to yourself. Right? So, so then you confess it to the Lord. Lord, this is me. I've done this. I've been this person. And, um, but the word says, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But the next part's very important too, that he's, that he's, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's huge because favoritism, you know, preferring people for any reason. Um, and again, usually it's because they're more like you in some way, shape or form. Um, that's all, that's all junk that we want out of our life. Now think about it this way. Do you want someone to discriminate against you because of your social economical background in the church or anywhere else? And the answer, of course, is going to be, well, no. So then, of course, we turn that back around and we go, well, if we don't want people to discriminate against us, right? The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to, unto you. Um, you should not have any words in your mouth or any, um, and really clean, start, you know, you rely on the Lord to start cleansing you of opinions and biases and um, and prejudices and things like that, um, wherever they may be in your life. And, I'm, and again, I'm telling you, uh, it's easy to just check that box and go, I, got, I have none of that. But it's really worth a, um, a, a closer look, a closer examination of ourselves than, than that, and to, uh, and to find ourselves and, you know, allow the Lord to scrub us clean. Because again, he says he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He didn't say we would cleanse ourselves of all unrighteousness. Good luck with that. That's called self-effort. <laughs> and if you could do that by self-effort, Jesus would not have had to come to die on the cross and make the Holy Spirit available to live in us. So the Lord said, I will cleanse you of all unrighteousness, but that's a two-way street. You know, we have to be willing to uh, submit to his um, correction. We have to be willing, as he shows us new things, to say, I'm open to changing. And then we have to align our willpower with him, it's not that you wrestle yourself into submission by willpower, but you certainly have to um, align your willpower with him. And if you do, then um, as we grow into be more like more like Christ, um, imagine yourself walking around with no biases. How would how would the world look then? It wouldn't be rich and poor people. It wouldn't be you know ethnic you know races and you know races and religions and all these different things. You're going to see people as people, and you're going to see the body of Christ. Um, as that exactly that all every one of us members of Jesus and so we should be valued as such right and so that's what James here is getting across to the early church and he says you're in verse 4 I already read he said you have evil motives now why would he say that you well if you've got a rich person you're trying to kind of smooth and then you got a poor person that you're paying no attention to it's because you feel like you there may be more benefit in catering to this person with money Maybe they will give you some influence or power or, you know, maybe they'll, whatever, you know how it is. Um, there may be something they can do for you. And, um, and so that's your motive. But if you didn't, you know, care what the rich person had and you don't care what the poor person doesn't have, you're not going to treat them any different because, in other words, you're not trying to get anything from them. You're trying to give, which what we should be trying to give people is Christ in us, you know, and show them who he is through us. And so... Let's move on to verse 5. 
Um, which, by the way, I'll slow down there again. So without skipping that too much, the, the point there is check your motives. If you, um, and again, I think if most of us will study ourselves, we're going to find different biases. Biases are natural. Um, it's, it'd be more unlikely to find someone that has zero biases than it is to find someone that has biases. You see what I'm saying? So if you have, um, if you check yourself, um, and you're looking for these biases, then look at your motives. And why is my, what is my motive for being this way? And a lot of times it's, you know, good old solidarity, right? This is how my family is. This is how my people are. This is how, you know, my coworkers are. This is how we roll in, you know, this kind of group think. And that's great if your group think is what Christ shows us in the Word of God. And again, I'm talking to believers here. And so um, for, if, and other people will watch this broadcast too that haven't re- received Christ and Maybe you're not a believer yet, but this is the standard that, um, not just a standard that the Lord holds believers to, but it is, um, it is who the Lord is, it is who Jesus is, and it's what we should see in the church. Now, of course we don't. The church is full of people, and you know, um, there's different levels of understanding, maturity, uh, and this is clear because as we're reading the book of James, he's talking to the church. He's correcting the church. And so um, as churches grow up and mature and people kind of get these things, you'll see biases and all this different division and stuff. That'll just go away. But uh, that goes away faster when you check your motives and make sure you don't have false motives or wrong motives. If your motives are to line up with the Lord and to love the Lord and love people with all your heart, you're going to be in pretty good shape. And that goes for all of us, right? It's a growing process. So um, verse 6 says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? And so what's going on there is that he's saying, if you really look to this early church, if you really look at it, they were being persecuted a lot by those people who had positions of authority and positions of, of power and finances and stuff like that. Now, does that make them, you know, that category of people bad? That's beyond ridiculous because there was a lot of people in the church that had um, funds. If you read through the book of Acts, who had fields to sell and they were selling things and they were using their finances um, for good, good purposes. But what James is saying is you're smoothing these people who have money and they're the same people that are persecuting you. And that's just, again, it's a natural tendency to do that. And he's trying to teach them this isn't how we live anymore. Um, that's the way the world lives, not us, right? So verse 8, uh, it goes on to say, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, as I mentioned earlier, you are doing well. So he calls that the royal law. Very, very interesting because if you know much about the Old Testament history, they lived by the law. But when it came to the New Testament we don't live by the law anymore, and yet here you are in James, which is a New Testament book, and he's talking about the law. Well, why is that? Because he's not talking about the law of Moses. He's not, the, not talking about the Ten Commandments, so to speak. Um, the Ten Commandments, so without going too deep into this, there were Ten Commandments, and, then, and I, there was over 600 other supporting uh, statutes that people had to follow in addition to the Ten Commandments that kind of backed them up. So if you break this law, here's the things that take place. If you break this law, so essentially they were jumping through hoops. Now, a lot of us still live that way to this day. I mean, that was one of the biggest challenges for me and something I still have to pay a lot of attention to is you is not living legalistically. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And then you're trying to earn um, your favor with the Lord. and You're trying to earn um, all these different things that Jesus has already paid for. That's not what's going on here. What the New Testament um, kind of speed of things is, or the, dis- the, the mindset, if you will, is um, that of love, and not superficial love, but true agape love. So again, if you, uh, I often use a like, like in our relationship to Christ to a, a marriage relationship, because that's a marriage covenant, and we are in covenant with Christ. That's essentially what we have here. And if you're in a marriage relationship, and everything is just check the boxes, and you're a good spouse because you just simply check the boxes. I did this for this person. I did that for this person, so they should be happy. 
that's a very uh, poor relationship. But if you love someone, you just do stuff for them voluntarily. You go out of your way for them voluntarily, um, and you're not counting the cost, right? And so that's that's the New Testament speed of things. As we learn to love God more, which is a which is a progression. I mean, first, you know, uh, come to Christ, you really don't know Him that well at all. But you know, years of being a believer and seeking Him and seeking to know Him, and I don't mean just reading the Bible again. I often refer to the Pharisees who read the scriptures all the time. And I know this is a little repeat from last week, but um, but they were very Bible oriented people, and they knew the Bible, but they had no love at all within them. And so, in fact, Jesus called them children of the devil. If that gives you any uh, insight of how much you can read the Bible, still not please the Lord. Okay. So, with that being said. Um, as we get to know the Lord more, and He, uh, it's kind of association. That's the way we grow in, in Christ. It's association, um, associating ourselves with God specifically. And He, of course, you can do that through reading the Word, going to church, um, listening to messages online. But if you're just doing it to stack information in your head, you're going to find that you're, you don't have much content in your heart. You're going to find that you're very dry, and it's going to be very um, religious. You're gonna have. It's gonna be very religious. You may you, you, now, mind you. Again, we've all been here. At least everybody I know, we've been here at some point or another. Or if not, I can certainly speak for myself. Um, but that's again uh, part of the, this the way of the world. So, why does James talk about the law of love then? Well, the law of love is that type of a law. It's a law that's not motivated by do's and don'ts. It's a a perfect law which would cause you to go. I'm gonna do to this person what I would want them to do to me, not what they've done to me, but what I'd want them to do for me because I have the love of Christ inside of me. And that takes faith because naturally speaking, if somebody does you wrong, you are want to do them wrong. If someone um, snubs you or hurts someone you love, you want to hurt them or snub them. That will be exactly the way the world works, but not how we're supposed to work. And so let's keep moving forward here. Um, I'm going to read verse 8 again because it flows into verse 9. So, if however you're fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, the scripture being, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors, transgressors, excuse me. So, that's just, I know it's a lot of words, but essentially he's saying, hey, if you're showing partiality and you can pick any area, you are, you are committing sin. Now, when we say the word sin, a lot of times, sin, I think it just, it's like, oh, you've done a sin. And it's just like, shame on you. You know, you kind of like tisk tisk and you, you know, that's not really what's the way I look at sin. The way I look at sin is sin is something that's going to hurt you and it's going to hurt other people. So if you allow it in your life, it's going to hurt you. It's not bad just because it's bad. Oh, you broke the rules. Um, that's not what it's about at all. And so, and you can see that. I mean, if you subtracted all partiality from the world, there was absolutely no partiality. Now, honor, again, there was honor of people in honorable positions and so on, but there was no preference of a person because of their demographic. You know, you don't prefer a poor person because they're poor, and you don't prefer a rich person because they're rich, and you don't prefer this ethnicity or that ethnicity or and sometimes it's cultural backgrounds and neighborhoods, you know, where we come from this side of the tracks and all this different stuff. If you subtract that from the world, imagine how much less conflict there would be. So what James is trying to do, well, it's really the Holy Spirit through James is endeavoring to do, is cleanse the church of that so that there's not these conflicts and fights and spats and these back and forth um, within the church body, which would be remarkable, of course, and the world would notice the difference. And of course, who doesn't want to be a part of that kind of environment? And so that would be the type of environment that the world would see with the church, which would be attractive to those who have good hearts. And it would also be the type of um, environment that they to come in and immediately plug into and do well, which is the way it's supposed to be. Um, so let's continue to move on. And now James is going to talk a little bit about the, uh, he's talking to Hebrew people. He's talking to Jewish people who have grown up with the law. If you remember from verse 1, he says he's specifically writing to the 12 tribes in the uh, that are dispersed, in the dispersing, which means the 12 tribes of Israel dispersed all throughout 
is places they've been scattered. So these people have grown up, and all they know, like most of us, all we know is, uh, you know, Christianity and that and everything it entails. All these people know, they didn't know anything about that. They grew up with the do's and don'ts of the laws of Moses, those Ten Commandments, and um, I think it's 613 different statues that uh, supported that. That's all they knew. So he's, he's kind of speaking in their language and helping them understand, um, you know, how to grasp where we're at today. So he says, uh, let's go to verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he becomes guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So what's he saying there? It's fairly straightforward, but I'll put it this way. Um, again, people, we like to, um, and there are things that are worse, uh, worse things than other things. The Bible says that all the time, that, you know, your sin was worse. Jesus talking to um, Pontius Pilate, actually, when he was being crucified, for example, he, um, he asked, Pilate was asking, you know, are you really a king and all this different stuff? And, and Jesus said, did you come up with that question or someone else say that about me? And Pontius Pilate's like, you know, am I a Jew? I, of course, I don't. I don't know that you're a king of anything, you know. I'm asking you because your people turned you over. And Jesus said, well, the person that turned me over, I'm paraphrasing, but you can go and read that for yourself. Just Google search it, um, if you will. But um, he says, but he who turned me over to you has committed a greater sin, okay? And so that's one example, but there's lots of examples of, you know, uh, greater punishment and less punishment. So the idea that there's just, it's all the same is not really biblical, but people say that, and I've said that lots of times in the past. I didn't really understand one way or another, but the reason people say it and what is accurate is what James is saying here is that breaking the law or, you know, offending uh, God through sin, so to speak, is offending God through sin. You know, it's sin is sin. And so he's saying, hey, listen, if your big thing is this person shouldn't be transgressing the law, this person shouldn't be doing these wrong things. Now, find your favorite category. You know, everyone's kind of uh, typically has something they really don't like. Well, look what this person said, or look what this politician has done, or look what this, uh, you know, authority figure did, or, you know, my parents did this, or, you know, my boss that, or my wife, or my husband, or whatever. And they, they usually have their own thing that they kind of like to, you know, everyone kind of zones in on, like, I don't like that. You know, their pet peeves, we call it. And yet the problem is you've got your own problems. You know, you've got your own shortcomings. We, we all have our own areas that we need to work on. And so what James is pointing out here is he's saying, listen, you, everyone's breaking, you know, they're all transgressing. So the law in different areas, and with that being the case, you shouldn't be the type of person that's sitting around trying to judge people. That's not your role, you know. Um, that's your role is to be building people up and um, forgiving people and, 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 and setting aside grievances and showing people uh, Christ who took your sins and mine and um, allowed himself to be crucified to a tree for things he never even, he, you know, he never even did. So that's our example. Um, so let's keep moving forward. So he says to these people, so speak and so act as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty, not the law of Moses, which is the Ten Commandments, but the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who shows no mercy. And then he goes on to say, mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay? So the law of liberty, I won't even pretend I understand everything that, that entails, um, but what I can tell you from what I have understood of it is the law of liberty is a law of faith because we've been set free in Christ, and we are free to live in Christ. And so we live by the Holy Spirit inside of us. In other words, that internal conviction. And again, I'm not saying this is everything that the law of liberty includes. I'm saying this is a facet of it, okay? And um, as we learn to learn to hear the inner, the inner voice of the Spirit, and we, um, because some things aren't written down in the law, like the law doesn't say, you know, don't intentionally annoy a person. But, you know, if you're intentionally annoying, being annoying to someone or whatever, um, you know it's wrong. And 
you're just doing it to be maybe facetious or maybe uh, they annoyed you. And I'm just using something that's ridiculous, but you know what I mean. Um, it doesn't say don't yell at people in traffic, you know, uh, don't, don't have road rage. That's not in the Bible. It's not written down. But when we're doing these type of things, there's something inside of us that's saying you shouldn't be doing that. That's not, that's, you shouldn't be doing that. And, um, and why is that? Because it's the Holy Spirit inside of us and he's trying to guide us correctly. Well, why is that even a big deal? Go back to what sin is. Sin is anything that's going to hurt you. And so how often has a little bit of annoyance and irritation blown up to really bad, you know, mean words or regrettable words, things that we regret saying like hours later and for hours after that, you know, or days later or years later, how often has rage turned in, you know, a little anger built up, built up unchecked into um, angry actions and child abuse and spousal abuse and um, just all kinds of uh, things that people lose jobs and lose family situations and what, why is that? Because they don't learn to control their anger. And it's not about just like, um, again, it's not about mental control and trying to just, uh, you know, strong arm your way into not uh, expressing anger. Because again, that would be self-effort. That would be, we could have done that without Jesus. But it's allowing the Holy Spirit, you know, getting closer to the Lord, admitting, I, I, you know, fell short here and changing and admitting I fell short here again and then changing and allowing the Lord to start working that out of you. And so that's the, the law of liberty. We are, we're free, and more importantly, we're free to live without anger. I mean, in terms of just this negative, um, uh, this overbearing, you know, anger, etc. That's a real thumb there. But um, so on. And so I'll go on beyond that and say not just that, but there's so many other emotional things, you know, like uh, sadness, depression, um, the, you know, anxiety, just all kind of filled, filled with worry and all these different things, you know what I mean? And you're free in Christ to, you've been set free. You don't have to live in that stuff anymore. Um, but it is still a process of working those things out. Now, and there's addictions, you know what I mean? Things that we would never have thought in a million years that you could get rid of these things out of us in certain ways of behavior and all this different stuff. And you're actually free to, to, to not live that way anymore. But again, um, that's a process that you have to allow the Lord to take you through. But can you imagine being free of that? Can you imagine never even like whatever the thing that has been your uh, downfall, so to speak, or whatever area that's just been an issue um, for you of temptation and sin. Can you imagine if you get to a point where you're like, I can't even remember the last time that was a temptation or sin. It doesn't, I, I can't remember the last time I was tempted. It's just not tempting anymore, you know? Because there's all things, there's things that, you know, that are sins that you're just not tempted by. Um, some people just aren't tempted with alcohol. Like, uh, it's just not a thing for them. Other people, they're like drugs. I'm just not into that, you know? Other people, you know, it's like the uh, pornography and the sexual stuff. They're like, that's just not really my thing. Um, but maybe they're very angry people, or maybe they're uh, this over here, or whatever the case may be. And so, but one of my point is, there's some things that just are not tempting to you. Can you imagine the thing that is tempting to you, the thing that has ruled your life, becoming like one of those, where it's just like, ah, it's not, it's just not tempting anymore. And that's where the Lord wants to take you. That's called liberty. That's called living in freedom. And that's what Christ offers. And that's what the world doesn't really offer. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not out there. So um, especially the way the Lord does it. Now, they may think, you know, well, hey, I used to be addicted to cigarettes, and now I'm not into cigarettes anymore, and so on. That definitely exists in the world. And there's things you can do through willpower. But um, when Christ sets you free from something, it's like not only did he set you free but there's a testimony and a, a spiritual uh, substance behind it that you can use not only in your own life to change your life, but you can, uh, you, can, it's, you can pass it on. I mean, you can use it to change other people's lives just the same. It's amazing. I, it's hard to describe spiritual things uh, in the natural terms, but that's the best I'll do for today. So anyway, so let's go on to verse 13. He said, I repeat, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, um, I think for today, that's where we're going to leave it. And I'll explain that verse and then leave it at that. But um, what does that mean? 
Well, first of all, mercy means that you've messed up or someone else has messed up. It means they've actually legitimately done something wrong and they deserve punishment. Now, if that's a scenario for you, do you want punishment? And the answer, of course, is no. You don't want punishment. What you want is mercy, right? Now, that's easy to say, but then when you look at, and you, and you, and you and watch what your mouth does so often when you see other people, this person in the news did this, this politician did this, this person did this, and you're, you know, so often naturally, you and me are naturally engineered to go, well, they should get this, and they should get this. I can't believe that guy did that. I would never do that. You know what I mean? And, um, and in the meantime, you're messing up in your own areas, you know? And so what, what he's saying is, if you're that person, you don't want other people to have mercy, then when it comes time for you to be judged, and everyone standing in front of the Lord, I promise you that's going to happen to you. And he's going to take your own standard of judgment and then apply it to you. Oh, you didn't want people to have mercy. Okay. Well, then you're not going to get any mercy. Let's go ahead and start talking about what you have been, you know, what judgment is due to you. And you're not going to want that. Well, how do you, you know, how do you put yourself in position to get mercy? You should be the first to give mercy. Now, does that mean that we just, every sin should go, you know, every, every wrongdoing should go unpunished and we just have a, a land of anarchy and, and chaos? No, that's, that's not what that means. But the Lord has put judges, he says he puts people in leadership positions to uh, moderate society. He has put politicians, he's put these things in uh, people in, in positions to handle that. And guess what? That ain't you. And that's not me. So we get the opportunity, the privilege, if you will, to extend mercy to people. And we say, man, it looks like that, uh, that, that person messed up or this thing went down really bad or um, my, my spouse did this and they, uh, and they really messed up over here. You know you shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, my, my, my sibling, you know, for younger people or whatever. Um, or and even when you're grown, grown siblings will do stuff too. And you're like, I cannot believe you did that, you know. Um, well, I would just tell you to, back to the golden rule, to uh, treat people not as they deserve to be treated, but as you would want to be treated when you mess up. And again, you, you're like, well, I would never do that. Maybe you don't ever do that, you know. Um, but have you done other things? And do you think you will want mercy in those areas? Probably so. And so what he goes on to say in the last part of that verse, he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Huge deal. Because if they're in an in a arm wrestling competition, mercy and judgment, mercy is going to win over judgment. Why is that imper important to us? Now, that's for people who receive the mercy, right? We give out mercy. We receive mercy. Why is that important? Because that's what Jesus dying on the cross is. It is mercy. In other words, we are all going to hell, you know. Uh, we are all headed down, and we could not live a perfect righteous standard. That wasn't going to happen. So what did God do? In his mercy, in his kindness, he sent Jesus, so this is John 3, 16 and 17, um, into the world to die for the sins of the world so that we could uh, really be restored to our relationship with him, essentially is what it boils down to. It's not just so we can go to heaven. A lot of times, that's, that's what I always thought. It's like, well, you know, you get saved so you can go to heaven. And that's especially before I was saved. I was like, that's pretty much the reason you do it, right? You have to serve the Lord because... Um, that's, I, you know, par for the course. It's just part of it. But that's not, that's not it. That means your whole life is just waiting to get to the other side, so to speak. But in reality, he um, has made it available that you and I can draw near to him, to get close to him, to actually build a real relationship. A, a, it's not like, you know, we're not seeing him physically, but you can be spiritually tied to um, the Lord and, and know him and hear from him and interact and, and go back and forth and get real answers to your life, um, even right now, you know, and that's what he wants. That's what Jesus died for, to restore that uh, spiritual interaction and connection that can grow and grow and grow. And so mercy triumphs over judgment in that sense that we all deserved judgment, but mercy um, has made it available for you and me, if we'll take the mercy, um, to receive Christ and start putting aside all those things that cause judgment and condemnation in our life, you know, 
God's not the condemner. If you read John 3, 17, I think I referenced that last week too, but it says Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. He didn't have to come into the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. He didn't show up to do that. So if you're in condemnation, you're like, oh, I'm such a bad person. I'm such a loser. I just, I've done these things. I'm so bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, you need to do either one of two things. You need to get saved and receive Jesus as your Savior so he can wash those sins away. Essentially, it's like he takes the bill of your sins. You've been in a restaurant. They give you a bill. How much is it? Well, that's expensive. You pay for it. It's paid. That's what he did with your sins. He, he stacked them all up. He said, this is all of them. This is all of them from beginning of life to the end, beginning of life to the end. He's like, all right, I'll pay for that. And he pays for that bill. So then why would you live in condemnation under those things? That's so John 3, 17. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But there is conviction. What is conviction? That's the Holy Spirit saying you shouldn't be yelling at people in traffic. You shouldn't be doing these things. It's not making you feel bad. That's what Satan does. He's the accuser. It's conviction like this is going to hurt you. It's more like telling a, a young kid, listen, don't touch the stove, okay? If you touch this, it will burn you. You know, and they keep going around playing around it. And you're like, hey, listen, I'm telling you, that's not condemnation. You're not condemning that kid. You are trying to warn that kid and, and, and save them from whatever they're, whatever they're doing. That's what conviction does, you know? You keep doing the same thing over and over, and you can get to a point if you just keep turning down the Holy Spirit, like, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to that. The Word says you'll sear your conscience. And what that means is you'll be doing things that are wrong. You don't even know they're wrong anymore. It used to be you knew, but now you really don't. And so He doesn't want you to get to that point. If you have a sensitive conscience, when you mess up, you know it, and you can correct. You know, take it before the Lord. You'll go, oh, that's me. Um, I, I did that. Take it before the Lord. Please forgive me. And then you're, you know... Um, he, he, he releases you of that. Now, there may be some reconstruction that has to be done, and, you know, you can get yourself in a position where there's consequences to be paid for those, those things you've done, or, you know, maybe you've offended some particular person, or your, you know, spouse, spouse is mad at you, or your boss has to walk you through some kind of, you know, reconciliation program, you did something at work, or whatever it is. 40 billion scenarios there. But you know what I'm saying. You might have to still walk, work, that, work that out, but as far as can, the Lord is concerned, he's like, I'm not holding it against you. I'm actually trying to help you um, get to where I want you to be. And so he's always on our side. So um, that's where we're going to leave it for tonight. So that's James 2, uh, 1 through 13, chapters 1 through 13. And I would imagine next time we'll get through James uh, 1, I'm sorry, James 2, chapters 14. Let me pause. James chapter 2, verses 14 through uh, through 26. And I'm intentionally cutting this um, shorter than the last one because, again, I don't want to um, rush through this. And, um, and I really do think that part of the reason I felt, the reason I'm doing this, I felt this was what the Lord had impressed me to do to make this Bible study available and to go through this. And that's one of the things that um, he had impressed upon me as a model for other people um, as you're reading your Bibles and, and you know, getting into the Word. And if you have your own rhythm and way of reading the Word, you know, go for it. Um, but some people, you know, it's like they're still growing in how to really read the Word. And I would tell you it's, uh, it would be better to read a verse and you get something that changes your life than to read six chapters of the Bible and um, walk away with nothing but uh, maybe head knowledge or maybe even worse, you just check the box and go, yep, I read, you know. Um, if the Word's not changing our lives, if we're not seeing how we can apply it in our day-by-day um, -day living, then we're not getting, to me, we're not getting the most out of it that we can. And not, not to say that um, understanding the history of the Bible and some of the nuances and some of these different things, I'm not saying that's not helpful. I think that gives us context for reading the rest of the Bible. But if you're reading the Bible like a novel or you're reading the Bible like a history book, or you're just reading it as a, a religious practice, um, and we all know this from personal experience. It's you just, uh, it's not helping you in life. You're not what you'll see is you're not really growing, you're not really changing, you're not getting revelation. There's not a lot of excitement there, and you're not probably, um, at least in my experience of doing things like that, you're not really walking by faith. You're just walking by routine, and that's not a really um, you don't really get to see the power of God very often 
in those scenarios. It's not that it's not there. It's not that it's not available to you. I'm saying from personal experience, it's just, you know, when you flip into routine mode, it just kind of loses something. And again, we experience that even with personal relationships. When your relationships are stale and they're just kind of routine, you're not really getting enjoying it. You're not getting the most out of it. Um, but when it's living and, and, and there's great fellowship and things like that, then you get a lot out of it. So that's more the point of uh, what we're doing with this Bible study. So anyway, um, I'm going to trust God that that helped you guys. And um, again, I recommend jumping on the uh, FHL YouTube channel and you can find more. Um, there, Like I said, there's personal content for me on there, but there's a lot more. Uh, that's probably <laughs> 2% of what's on there, maybe maybe less than that. Um, there's just a lot of good things if you'll go through the, the playlist section, so I highly recommend that. So that's it, guys. We will see you next time. God bless you.